Welcome back everyone, this is Kevin Wallace again. In our previous video you might recall that we discussed analog voice ports, FXS, FXO, e and &M ports. In this video we're going to discuss digital voice ports. Before we get into the voice ports specifically, let's contrast analog and digital for a second with an analog waveform, like the spoken voice. When you speak, there's this sound wave that comes out of your mouth and it continually varies. There are an infinite number of points that we would have to interconnect to completely, faithfully reproduce your original spoken voice. So in the digital world, we don't completely reproduce the original spoken voice, but we get really, really close. We get close enough so that it sounds good. What specifically is happening is we're going to represent this continually varying analog waveform digitally by representing it as a series of ones and zeros. How do you represent a one or a zero electrically? Well, oftentimes a zero is represented by the absence of voltage, and a binary one is represented with the presence of voltage. And like I've drawn for you on screen, that presence of voltage might be a positive voltage, it might be a negative voltage, but it's the presence of voltage that gives us a binary one. And we'll talk later in just a few moments about why we might go back and forth between a positive voltage and a negative voltage. This all brings up the question, how do we convert between the analog waveform and the digital waveform? It kind of reminds me when you go to the movies. And in the movies you're sitting there and you're watching a film and unless it's in 3D and you actually have two different images being projected, if it's a regular movie you're seeing on average 24 frames projected every second. But those frames are projected in such rapid succession it appears to you to be smooth motion up there on the movie screen. Something similar is going on when we encode the spoken voice. What we're going to do is we're going to take snapshots of this continually varying waveform. Let's imagine that this is our original signal. What we can do is go in and measure the volume or measure the amplitude at different points along this waveform. And then we can represent the value of those samples, the volume, whether the volume is positive, it's above the line, it's negative, it's below the line. We can represent that volume approximately using binary digits, zeros and ones, which we can send over a digital network. Here's the challenge though. What if we don't take enough samples? Let's say that we took the samples that I'm representing on screen with these dots. If we played a game of connect the dots right now, would this faithfully reproduce the original signal? Let's see. Actually, no. If we interconnect these dots, we're going to have what is referred to as an aliased signal. Aliasing is what happens when we don't take enough voice samples. There's also the concept of taking too many voice samples. We could do oversampling, and that might improve your music quality if you're ripping a CD, for example. However, we don't want to burn extra bandwidth in the voice world just to get that little extra bit of higher quality. In the voice world, we don't want to take too many samples over sampling, but we don't want to take too few samples, which would be something that could result in aliasing. So what's the magic number? How many samples, how many snapshots, how many measures of volume do we take per second? It goes back to the early 1930s. There was a college professor named Harry Nyquist, and Harry Nyquist came up with the Nyquist Theorem. And it goes like this. Harry Nyquist, and yes, I know, in the 1930s, there was no concept of digital communication, but he came up with a theory back then. And it goes like this. If you want to be able to reproduce an analog waveform based on samples of that waveform that you take, the minimum number of samples that you have to take is twice the highest frequency that you're trying to reproduce. Twice the highest frequency. What is the highest frequency for voice? Well, if we think about the human ear, the human ear can hear from about 20 hertz at the low end to about 20,000 hertz at the high end. Well, a young human ear can hear to about 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz at the high end. After you get past your teenage years, that top end starts to degrade just a little bit. You might have heard about the cell phones that have ringtones that are at such a high frequency that the kids in school can hear the frequency, but the teachers cannot. So kids can be getting phone calls and the teacher never knows. But do we need that high fidelity when we're trying to reproduce voice? 
Actually, no. Studies have shown that over 90% of human speech intelligence is carried under 4,000 hertz, 4 kilohertz. In fact, for decades, the phone company has kind of set that as their top line, the top frequency that they're going to try to transmit. In fact, a lot of voice equipment is designed to have a high end frequency of about 3,300 hertz, with the rest of the frequencies up to 4,000 being used for some out of band signaling. But the bottom line is, we say that 4,000 hertz is the highest frequency that we're concerned with in the voice world. Now, based on what Mr. Nyquist or Professor Nyquist taught us, we need to take that number of 4,000 and double it. 4,000 times 2 is 8,000. We should be taking 8,000 samples per second. And when we take a sample, we're measuring the amplitude. We're measuring the volume at an instantaneous point in this analog waveform. And decades ago, here's the way a lot of systems worked. They used something called pulse amplitude modulation, or PAM, PAM. PAM worked like this. PAM used a carrier frequency. In fact, let me make up some numbers. Let's say 10,000 hertz is one of our carrier frequencies, 10 kilohertz. We could vary that 10 kilohertz signal's amplitude based on the amplitude of the samples that we were taking. And we could have another carrier frequency, maybe at 20 kilohertz, and we could vary that 20 kilohertz signal. We could vary its amplitude just as another voice call's amplitude was varying. And as a result, we could have these different carrier frequencies on the very same line carrying different voice conversations. Again, that's called PAM, Pulse Amplitude Modulation. However, Pulse Amplitude Modulation is not what we're going after in the voice over IP world. We want to not have carrier frequencies. We want everything to be ones and zeros. And Professor Nyquist has helped us out. He's told us how many samples we have to take. And as I was saying that, I remembered a time that I was teaching this several years ago. I was teaching with my good friend Jeremy Chara, and I was explaining the Nyquist theorem to students. And Jeremy is not as mathematical as I am. You see, my background is electrical engineering. That's what my college degree is in, so I geek out on some of this stuff. Jeremy said that he would call it the NyQuil theorem. It was putting him to sleep. But I hope you guys enjoyed the explanation of the Nyquist theorem. And let's get back to our story now. We've taken these samples. We need to digitally represent them. So what we do, we take these volumes that we have recorded, and we try to assign a number. Here's the challenge. There's only so many numbers to which we can assign these volumes. We don't want to have too many values that we could say, well, this has an amplitude of a 1, and this has an amplitude of a 2 or a 3. If we have too many values, it starts to take too much bandwidth. Too many bits are required to represent the different volumes. Take a look on screen. We've got three volume levels I've drawn, 1, 2, and 3. And notice how the actual volume for most of these samples that we took, the actual volume doesn't match up perfectly with any of these. We don't have anything that matches up perfectly with a 1 or a 2 or a 3. I've drawn a little bracket and given the symbol for a delta. The delta is a difference. There is a difference. There is a delta between each of these samples, the amplitude of these samples, and the actual number on the graph. We're having to round off a little bit. This can be a bad thing. This leads to quantization noise. What does quantization noise sound like? It sounds like hiss, background noise. So this is a balancing act. We want good quality, but we don't want to use too many bits to represent the different volumes. How can we improve this without severely impacting our bandwidth? Well, on screen, I've drawn a linear scale. Notice that we have about the same amount of space between the number 1 and the number 2 as we do between the number 2 and the number 3. Each number is equally separated, in other words. Instead of using a linear piece of graph paper like you used in high school, do you remember in high school using logarithmic graph paper? That's what we use here. We want to use a log scale. Check this out. Here, notice that at the bottom end of the volumes, at the low end, we're much more accurate with our measurements. Notice all of the little hash marks as we go up the scale. The scale vertically is divided into different segments. We have on screen segment 0, segment 1, and that should probably be segment 2. I just noticed it said segment 3. But we've got these different segments, and within a segment, we've got all these little hash marks that are called steps. And you notice that we're more accurate at the lower volumes. We're not going to use more bits, but the sound is going to improve. Here's why. By being more accurate at the lower volumes, we get two benefits. Number one, most samples occur at the lower volumes. 
So by using this logarithmic scale and we're being more accurate at the lower volumes, that's going to improve quality for most of our samples. And the second big benefit of using a logarithmic scale is at the high end, when the amplitudes are the loudest, when the volume is really cranked up, the amplitude is so loud it tends to drown out the quantization noise anyway. So two big benefits for a logarithmic quantization scale. We're more accurate for more samples, and at the latter samples we're going to drown out a lot of the background noise anyway. That's what we want to do. And I've used the metaphor of a logarithmic sheet of graph paper to describe how this works. The way the scale is mathematically determined is a little bit more complex than that. There's a couple of approaches, and these two approaches are called companding methods. That's short for compressing and expanding. The two companding methods that we have are mu law, the Greek letter mu, and alpha law. Since we don't have a Greek letter mu on most of our keyboards, we typically write it, type it, or enter it into a router's configuration as the letter U. And since we don't have a lot of alpha keys on our keyboard, we use the letter A for alpha law. U law, or mu law, that's very common in North America, in Japan. Alpha law is most common outside of North America and Japan. And now that we have this more accurate scale, let's see how many bits are we going to use to represent each of these samples that we take. It's going to be 8 bits, and I've broken them down for you here on screen. The first bit is the polarity that I've represented with a P. This sample might be above the zero line, a positive value. It might be below the zero line, a negative value. The first bit represents the polarity. Then we have 3 bits to say in which segment does it fall. And then within that segment, we've got four bits to say which step within that segment are we closest to. Yes, we're still going to round off a little bit. Yes, there's still going to be some quantization noise. But we're going to be more accurate for more samples, and it's going to sound overall better by using a logarithmic scale. But do you notice on screen we have a grand total of eight bits to represent one sample? And Professor Nyquist told us that we should take 8,000 samples per second if our high-end frequency is 4,000 hertz. So we're taking 8,000 8-bit samples every second. How many bits per second is that? 8 times 8,000? 64K. 64,000 bits per second. That's a number that comes up a lot in telephony, and that's where it comes from. It comes from taking 8,000 samples that are 8 bits each. In fact, a 64K circuit is referred to as a DS0 in digital circuits. Again, here's how we get those 8 bits. We have one polarity bit, we have three segment bits, and then we have four step bits for a grand total of 8 bits. Now that we understand a bit more about how we can take the spoken voice and take all these samples and then digitally represent these samples using 8 bits per sample, what sort of digital circuits do we have out there today? Well, we often hear about E1 circuits or T1 circuits or different kinds of ISDN circuits. Let's think about this for a moment. A T1 circuit is a digital circuit that has 24 channels. How big is each channel? 64K, just like we talked about. It has 24 DS zeros. An E1 circuit has 32. Careful when you read this in the literature. A lot of literature will have you believe it's 30 or 31. We'll talk about this later. It's actually 32 DS zeros that we have inside of an E1 circuit. Again, a T1, kind of like mu law, is most popular in North America and Japan, and an E1 is most popular outside of those regions. These are very popular types of digital circuits that we might use to connect out to an IP WAN, but we also hear about ISDN, Integrated Services Digital Network. That technology is a mature technology. It's been around for over a couple of decades. I first heard about it back in the late 80s. And what a lot of people don't understand is that you can actually build an ISDN circuit on top of a T1 or an E1 circuit. If you do that, what you've created is an ISDN primary rate interface, a PRI circuit. 